If you would rise to your feet in the honor of God's word, we're coming from the book of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy. It comes just before 2 Timothy. It's Paul's first letter to his spiritual son, Timaeus. He had basically two spiritual sons, uh, actually probably three, but he wrote letters to two, Timothy and another young man named Titus. Titus was on the island of Cyprus as a pastor, and Timothy was in a city called Ephesus, which was a sin-filled, wild city, kind of like Vegas of its day. And he had the task of preaching there. And Paul felt it necessary to write him twice to encourage him. Now, how hard must it have been if Paul had to write you twice to lift you up, to help you out? And most of his problems was not with the people outside. It was the people within the four walls of his church that were giving him a hard time. So have mercy. Have mercy. But obviously Ephesus lasted because we have the book of Ephesians and 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. So there you have it. How good is that? If you have it, say amen. If you need more time, say hold on, Pastor. Very good. We're just going to lift up verse 15 and it reads, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. I'm going to read it one more time. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the chief. Please be seated and pray with me now. Father God, we just thank you right now for all that you're doing in our lives, Lord. We're coming into the time of the year where people are reflecting on life, situations, and circumstances that has occurred. We're gathering together as families, as friends, as co-workers, as fellow laborers in the, in, the, in the Word, Lord. But as we do this, let us remember the main reason for the season. It is your son, Jesus. As we reflect upon why he came, what he done, and why he did what he did. Because he, you loved us. So, Father God, let us receive your message now today as we talk about the love that you have, the, the things that we are, and how we should act, and how we should behave. Father God, we always don't do the things we should do, but give us the grace and mercy to do the things that we ought to do. Father God, be with us right now. Let our hearts and minds not be distracted by the things at home or the things on TV or anything that's other than your word right now. Let us focus solely upon you. Let my congregation see you and hear you and not me. Make me small, but you rise up in me, become greater, so that your word may go forth and grow and increase in the thing that you have planted it in. Father God, we just thank you for this day and all things, and we thank you in advance for the whosoever that want to give their life to Christ today. And it is in your name and the mighty name of Jesus we pray and give thanks. And the church said, Amen. Amen. I'm going to lift it up one more time. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Christ came to save sinners of whom I am the chief. I'd like to speak from the thought this morning. Boss of sinners. Boss of sinners. Turn and smile at your neighbor and say, neighbor, oh my neighbor, you're not the boss of me. We've been talking about forgiveness here, Steve. We've been talking about forgiveness over the last couple of Sundays. And the Apostle Paul is famous for many things. Having a brilliant mind and perfect knowledge of the Old Testament. He was a perfect choice, Ms. Lorraine, to be the vehicle by which his message would move around the Roman world. But during his travels, many people, Julie, distrusted him because of his past, not letting him forget the things he had done or because they were afraid to associate with him because of what he had done. And that's what we're going to see here in today's text. Paul is apologizing, Kevin, explaining the reasoning behind why he did what he did. You see, Trish, he's letting everyone know that he was the boss 
of sinners. Look at your text, verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. And this is where I'd like to give you three for the Trinity, for the glory of God. We see my first point. We see Paul's present position. We see Paul's present position. And he was thankful, and God counted him faithful. He was thankful, and God counted him faithful. Look at the text, Paul's present position. God has made him the spiritual leader to several churches. He has planted, Ms. Minerva, multiple churches in Greece, in Asia Minor, present-day Turkey. You see, he journeyed on several missionary trips spreading the gospel message of Christ crucified, dead, buried, and risen Lord of all. You see, Alex, he is the leader in the church and advisor and spiritual father to Timothy, a young pastor at the church of Ephesus. But Paul has done far more than that. You see, let's remind some folks what Paul's accomplishments were. Having written 13 of the 27 books of the New Testament, he has influenced many millions of believers. Influencing everything from doctrine to daily living with your neighbors. But look at the text carefully. We see how God has used Paul's position to be in the ministry. You see, that's what God's plan is for everyone all along. To be used by God in his ministry. To spread the message of the gospel around the world. Just by your lifestyle, just by your actions, just by how you walk and talk in front of non-believers, you can either attract or repel someone to Christ or from Christ. You see, here's the thing about Paul. Paul in Acts 9, 15 and 16 tells us that a believer by the name of Ananias was told by Jesus how Paul was going to be used by him. And Jesus told him he's going to be a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. And we too were called by Christ to go spread his message of going to teach and preach about him coming back from the dead, dying and forgiving our sins for our salvation. He's going to show Paul that he's going to suffer many things for his sake. Jesus had put Paul in that position to be an apostle and a preacher for him. And he's done that for each and every born again believer. But here's what I want everyone to understand about Paul. Paul never said he wasn't thankful or that he regretted or disliked or didn't want to do his job. In none of the letters Paul wrote, he said that. Even when trials, tribulations, and troubles came, Paul knew why and where he could get refreshed. He got his strength from his increasing power from Say it, sweet name with me. Somebody say, Jesus. He said it himself. He said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You see, Paul communicated. Paul encouraged. Paul let every born again believer today, yesterday, and forever to know that in every letter that he wrote, that we get our strength and power from Jesus Christ. Paul had the ability to reach, preach, and teach. And for that, he was thankful. But look at the text again. Paul says, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me. He thanked God for giving him the ability to do all he could do in the ministry. He didn't take credit for the churches he planted. No, no. He didn't take credit for the people he saved. But he thanked God. And he recognized his source of power. His ability to do it was through Jesus. He said, Jesus who enabled me. But here's what I love about Paul the most. He was humble. Because, in his, because of his previous history, he didn't think he was worthy enough to be used by God. Now, I know some folks probably think that about themselves. You don't know what I've done, Pastor Stewart. You don't know what was happening in my life. You are the things I'm, I'm ashamed of. Yeah, God knows, you know, but here's the thing. Let him use you for his glory. You see, Paul said, for he counted me faithful, meaning 
God saw that he was worthy enough by Jesus to be used in the ministry. He was faithful enough. He was good enough. He wasn't perfect, but he was good enough to be used. Who can save me from being a wretch undone? No one but the man called Jesus Christ. Who can wash away my sins? No one but Jesus on that cross. Counts all of us worthy to be in his Lamb's book of life. You see, nowhere in the Bible does it say you have to come to God perfect. Let me be clear about it. You come just as you are. You see, Crystal, we can't come perfect because we've all sinned. That's why Jesus came to reconcile, to set right, to correct the mistakes of one man, the man named Adam, whose sin was passed down from generation to generation. And let's face it, some of us are really good at sinning. Yeah, yeah, some of us really are. God counted Paul faithful in spite of his shortcomings, in spite of his past. Paul did a lot of things. But here's the question, what about the things you've done? We can never sit in judgment of a person when we have our own closet full of dry bones rattling around every day, reminding us of what we've done. You see, Jesus reminds us in Matthew chapter 7 about looking at one another's sins and judging because we've all fallen short of the glory of God. Jesus basically says, paraphrasing it, stop looking at the splinter in your neighbor's eye when you got that big old telephone pole sticking out of your own eye. Paul in the next verse confesses knowing that he has been forgiven of his sins. You see, Sean, we should be like Paul, confessing what we've done wrong. You see, only Jesus can forgive us. You see, 1 John 1 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, that will lead me to my second point. Look at the text, verses 13 and 14. Who was before a blasphemer, a persecutor, and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. You see, Erica, we're going to see my second point. We see Paul's past problems. Paul's past problems. He explains what he has done and how God excused his mistakes. Look at Paul's past problems. You see, Don, everybody makes mistakes in life. There are none righteous, no, not one. And I like to remind everyone, including myself, that we've all been something, all done some things that were not of God. We may have behaved in ways that were more worldly than godly. You see, Paul explains that in clear, vivid detail when he describes himself. As a matter of fact, for anyone who may have missed any Sunday school or any church services at all, Acts chapter 7, Acts chapter 8 and 9 tells us everything Paul did. I'm going to quickly recap for those of you who may not be familiar with Paul's story. Listen to what he done in Acts 7. They cast Stephen out the city and stoned him. But a young man named Saul was holding the coast. And in chapter 8, he consented to the death of Stephen. He led the great persecution of the church. He scattered believers throughout Judea and Samaria. Saul made havoc of the church, entering everyone's house, dragging men and women, committing them to prison. And in verse, in Acts chapter 9, he was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. And went to the high priest asking for warrants of arrest to go to Damascus and capture anyone that was a follower of Jesus Christ. You see, his thing, Paul was a Christian killer. Had no problem killing you. If he saw you on the street as a Christian, he would kill you dead. He would arrest you first and then kill you dead. You, here's the thing about it. His sole purpose in his mind was to destroy the church of Jesus Christ because he believed that they were preaching heresy. That God cannot have a son and that Jesus was not that Messiah that went to the cross. But I thank me to God that Jesus knocked him down on the Damascus rose on his back and called him to preach the gospel. You see, from that day forward, Paul was zealous for the Lord, preaching the message of Christ. You see, Paul's past problems, but look at how he explains what he did. He took accountability. He took ownership 
ownership for what he done. You see, Miss Rebecca, some people don't want to take ownership for what they done. They want to place blame on everyone else, but sometimes you got to look in the mirror and point the finger at yourself. Paul says here in the verses, he says, I was a blasphemer, meaning he was against Jesus because he fought against Jesus. He was a prosecutor. He attacked the church. He was injurious. He locked up, tied up, tried everyone who believed in Jesus and tried to kill them. But I thank God for that conjunction, Miss Nancy, the but. You see, buts moves a lot of things out of the way. And sometimes we got to move our buts out the way to clear up and explain a lot of our excuses. You see, that explains why people do what they do. We can all say, if it wasn't for the grace of God, there go I. But, you see, you can finish that thought and write your own life story. We all have some buts that got in our way. Only you and God know where you would be and what you would have been if you didn't do what? Look at what the text says. But I obtain mercy. Somebody say mercy. If it wasn't for the grace and mercy of God, where would I be? God extended mercy, gave you, gave me grace and mercy. And I thank God for his mercy because let's all be truthful. If God gave us what we truly all deserve for our sins, somebody have mercy. Look at the text, verse 13. It explains why Paul did what he did. It says, because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Now, here's the thing. Paul attacked the churches because he didn't believe in Jesus. He was ignorant. Mr. Nell, anyone here besides me and you know what the difference between ignorant and stupid is? You see, we all heard of Forrest Gump say stupid is and stupid does. Let me explain. The word ignorant means to have the absence of knowledge of something. For example, when we were young children, we had no idea how to tie our shoes. So we were ignorant. We just didn't know how to do it. But Miss Yvonne, here's the thing about it. Now that we all are educated, taught, learned, know how to tie our shoes, you see, stupid comes in like this. When we don't apply what you learn to the situation that's applicable to what you've been taught. Sometimes that can be a bitter pill. You see, um, I've been called stupid when I was a kid because I didn't know how to add and subtract. I was horrible at math. But here's the thing. I didn't apply what I was taught in the situation. We can't be stupid. We have to be applicable to the knowledge of Jesus Christ in our life for salvation of sins. Now, a person is considered stupid when they keep tripping up over their shoestrings after knowing how to tie them. It's the same thing here for Paul. He didn't know he was attacking Christ Jesus and was killing Christians. But once Jesus knocked them on his rusty dust, he knocked them down so low that he had to look up high to see Jesus. He preached, he reached, and taught every man and woman about the Savior. We got to be like him. You see, Paul spread the gospel like peanut butter on a jelly sandwich. He spread it all over that bread. And that's the same thing we got to do. But the best part is this. It's how God excused. The better word for that is forgave what Paul had done. Look at verse 14. The grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. Somebody say grace. It's amazing, isn't it? It can save a sinner and turn him into a saint. Look at the word picture of love here in these verses. First, when Jesus gives grace, it's always in excess. It's not by the little bit, but a lot. Look at the words, exceeding abundant. Somebody say more and more. That's what Paul is saying here. The grace of our Lord was more and more. Both words are adjectives that describe the amount of something. Exceeding and abundant. Basically, Paul is saying more and more. Look at the text where we get more of. We get more of faith. We get more of love. Somebody should have shouted right there. You get another chance. Look at where faith and love is located. Look at the text. Look at where it's located. Which is in Christ Jesus. Now go ahead and shout. Everything we need is in Christ Jesus. We get more faith. We get more love. Everything 
we've ever wanted and could ask for comes from above, from the Father of life. He never changes, but always provides what we need. But here's the best part. He only knows how to bless us with more and more. How do I know this? You see, Paul uses the same phraseology in Ephesians 3.20 when he said, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. Let me be clear to you. Let me tell you. It was Jesus who gives us even more better. Say a sweet name with me one time. Somebody say Jesus. John 10.10 10 says the same thing. Jesus said it this way. The thief does not come to accept to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. That's more and more. Oh, that was your chance to shout. But here, anybody need more and more of something today? More peace? Call on Jesus. More joy? Trust in Jesus. More companionship? Walk with Jesus. More provision for your life? Believe in the good shepherd Jesus. More protection? Know him as your shield and buckler. He'll fight all your battles. More grace? More mercy? More faith? More love? I'll say it again. More and more. He is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think. But here's the thing, for us to obtain that, for us to have that, you have to have a relationship with Jesus. You can't get this for free. It's given to you freely, but you have to sacrifice and give your heart in faith to Jesus by confessing his name. When you need to see more Jesus, he wants to know if you want to see more of him. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. You might not have been having all your needs met right now because maybe you're not you're not seeking Jesus. You might be seeking the things of this world. Like our computers, like our cell phones, maybe we all need a factory reset. Just ask Jesus to reveal to you, show you what you're doing wrong, or show you what you're doing right in your life, and believe in faith that he will do it. You see, the Bible says in Psalms 139, 23, and 24, he says, Search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me. That means to test. Try me and know my anxieties, my worries, my desires my fears. Verse 24 goes on to say, and see if there's any wicked thing in me, any wicked way, and lead me into everlasting. David when he confessed that was asking God to search me, cleanse me, see me. If there's anything that's not of you, take it out of me and put more of you in me. Let's be clear about it. Some of us need a factory reset. Just go ahead and hit that little button on your phone and it puts it right back in place. Or your computer, put that little button back in place. What we need to do is get on our knees, pray and confess and get a factory reset. The only way to get that factory reset is to seek Jesus first in his word, spending time with him. Isaiah 55 and 6 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. God gave Paul everything he needed. God gave you and me everything we needed. He gave us more faith and more love. Again, all those things are found and located in Christ Jesus. You can't find that type of love in the world. Perfect love can only be found in Christ Jesus. Come on, give God some glory right now. Come on and give us some praise. Well, let's review. We see our first point. We see Paul's present position. He was thankful and God counted him faithful. We see our second point. Paul's past problems. He explains what he has done and how God excused his past mistakes. But my third and final point, we see God's pattern for believers. God's pattern for believers. We all were chiefs to sin, but now we are servants of Christ. We all were chiefs to sin, let's be honest. But now we are servants of Christ. Look at the text, verse 15 and 16. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance 
that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of who I am chief. How be it for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Miss Sue, we'll discuss the pattern for believers later, but first look at the text about the chief to sin. In verse 15, Paul is reflecting on everything he's ever done that was contrary to how he believed and lived for Jesus. Remember back in verse 13, all the things he used to do, a blasphemer, a persecutor, an injurious person, these things he done ignorantly to hurt the church. As it is in verse 15, Paul is owning up to the wrongdoings. Both, but it's here is the best part about Paul. He said that every believer knows, Sean. Every believer know, and every unbeliever know there's a better way. There's a better way. There's an old saying, when you know better, you do better. That Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Paul tells you, tells me, and tells everyone that he is the chief, the boss, the bad man. He's the bad guy. He's the sinner. Paul, when he met Jesus, realized one thing is true. He is just a man, and Jesus is Lord. And when he recognized that, he accepted Jesus as his Savior. He knew his place, boss of sinners. Let's be clear about it. We all need to come to Christ and recognize our relationship where we are. We're not in charge of Jesus. Jesus is over us. We are the boss of sinners. Whatever thing you like to do the most that is against God, that is your sin. You see, Miss Tammy, you could have been the boss of stealing. I could have been the boss of gossiping. We all could have been the boss of, li boss of lying, cheating, idolatry, jealousies. Brothers and sisters, let me know when I'm knocking down your mailbox. Outbursts of wrath, outbursts of selfish ambition, envies, murders, drunkenness, hating your brother and sister. When all else fails, maybe you might have been the boss of not believing in Jesus for the salvation of your sins. Maybe you just don't think you need to repent. But I'm here to tell you, you must be. You got to be born again. But look at the text, verse 15. This is a faithful saying, meaning this is a true thing, worthy of all acceptance, meaning you have to take ownership of this, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. But the last part, that puts a, put a mark on everybody of whom I am chief. Now, I'm not sure, maybe at your job, what they used to call people. When I was in the Marines, a person in, in charge would be called chief or boss. That would be you the man in charge. You one running the show. Jesus' whole mission statement is summed up in this verse. He came to save sinners. And here's the thing. He came to save the worst of sinners. Paul wanted everyone to know, you ain't done what I've done. I've done some ugly things. I've done some terrible things. I'm the chief of those things. But here's the thing. At Christmas time, we get caught up in giving gifts when the greatest gift ever was born in a manger on a cold night in Bethlehem. For he who made Made him who knew no sin to become sin for us that we might in exchange get the righteousness of God from him. You see, he didn't spare his own son Jesus, but delivered him up for all of us. How can he not freely give us all things, including the gift of eternal life? And after all the wrong that we've done, Jesus' blood covers every sin that we have ever done. It covers it completely, entirely, fully, every inch and every corner of all our sins. Only if we believe in him and confess, he will give us the forgiveness. That's why Paul openly confessed to be the chief of sinners. He fought against Jesus. He was Jesus' number one public enemy against every believer. And because of that, he too can confidently believe in Jesus for his forgiveness for all the sins he's done. But I know somebody doesn't believe me, but let me put some Bible to it. Look at verse 16. How be it for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should, should hereafter believe on him to, to life everlasting. 
That's the servants of Christ. This cause, this purpose, he served. His purpose, his mission, the objective. Look at the text again. For this cause, I have obtained mercy. What was his cause? Preaching the message of Jesus Christ. Well, how do I know it? I obtained mercy in me that first Jesus might show forth all long suffering. In him, Paul showed that I can do every kind of wrong there is and be forgiven. And if God can't forgive me, what can he do for you? Because I know none of you done as much as what I've done wrong. That's what Paul is saying. I am the chief of sinners and I've obtained mercy first in me and now is a pattern to show forth for the cause of Jesus Christ. Jesus showed Paul mercy by using him for his glory. Paul did suffer. You can read about it in chapter 11 and 12 of 2 Corinthians. All the hardships, all the shipwrecks, all the beatings. But here's the best part. Look at the last part of verse 16. For a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to everlasting life. Let me explain. The word pattern here, Margie, is used to explain or mean a blueprint or a design that is copied as an exact example or to be repeated. In other words, every believer can read Paul's letters. Every believer can understand what he went through, understand his doctrine, sympathize with his hardships and suffering. Why? Because everyone who desires to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So as we walk this Christian journey, we will all follow Paul's pattern for believers. Paul summed it up this way in 1 Corinthians 11 and 1. Imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. And if we do that, we are truly following Paul's pattern for believers. Somebody should have shouted out there. You see, we are all here to follow after somebody. We all have examples of someone. But the best example set forth for us is Jesus. And then Paul says, yes, I'm the chief of sinners. I'm the best example of how to obtain forgiveness because I did some of the worst things but Jesus gave me mercy Jesus gave me love Jesus gave me grace the life application point here for, my, for you my brothers and sisters there is no sin there is no wrong there is no evil thing you've done so great that God cannot forgive if you confess and believe in Jesus for forgiveness of your sins, he is faithful in grace and mercy to extend it to you. You can begin experiencing that grace and mercy that Paul is preaching about. But you have to start with that relationship with Jesus. You have to know him as your savior today to experience that grace and mercy. You see, Randy, at one time we all thought we were the baddest thing in the world. When we didn't know Jesus, we did what we want, when we want, how we wanted, and we did what we thought was right in our own eyes. You see, Deb, we leaned on and depended on our own wisdom, our own power, our own ability to make things happen in this world. But sister Stewart, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly, the sinner. But here's the best part, brothers and sisters, that though he died, he rose. And even though he bled, his precious blood covered every sin of ours. And even though he humiliated and shamed so that we could be elevated and adored. You see, even though he suffered every unthinkable, unmanageable, unimaginable thing. He had his mind on me while he was on the cross saying to the Father, Father forgive them. They know not what they do. Why? Why? Because he died to save the chief of sinners, the boss of sinners. He died to save you and me. But here's the best part. By him to reconcile all things to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven or having made peace through his precious blood on the cross. Brothers and sisters, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world came down to earth 40 and two generations was born of a virgin was born in a manger was born for one purpose to save the world to save sinners to save the chief of sinners 
of whom I am the boss. To God be the glory.